All right. Good morning, Upstate Church Five Forks. Hope you guys are doing good. I'm a little insulted. The first service when they when they said that I was here just yelled really loud, and yeah, I, I heard some of you guys groan like it, it, well, you weren't as loud. It's all right. I'm gonna teach my my campus Harrison Bridge. I'm gonna teach them how to do the yell like that first service did. That was awesome. Uh, if, we, if this is your first time here, my name is Dallas Wilson. I'm one of the teaching pastors. Uh, and man, it's just always a pleasure to be with you guys. And, and let me just start by telling you this morning, Dustin's at another one of our campuses uh, filling in. And I want to take a moment when he's not here. Okay, listen, last time I preached here, he was here, so I couldn't do this because I didn't want him uh, to hear what I was going to say. Mainly, I don't want him to know that I like him, all right? No, uh, no, I'm just kidding. That's a joke. Uh, I, but I, I didn't want to do this with him here because it would have been uh, really awkward. But I just hope you guys know just how blessed you guys are to have Dustin, man. Uh, Dustin legitimately, very, very legitimately has become like a, a brother to me over the past four years. Somebody uh, who is one of my greatest friends, one of my greatest confidants. I, I, man, uh, I, I love having Dustin in my life. Uh, and th- over the past four years, uh, we've gotten to be pretty good friends to the point where Dustin knows uh, that one of my favorite things uh, about Christmas, as a matter of fact, my favorite thing about Christmas, other than Christ being born, is the Little Debbie Christmas tree cakes, all right? And so, uh, not this past Christmas, but the Christmas before, Dustin was at Harrison Bridge campus right around Christmas when the Christmas tree cakes came out, and he told Harrison Bridge how much I loved him and challenged him to bring me a box, and I want you to know I went home with 54 boxes of Christmas tree cakes, all right? Now, I I think Dustin hates me because if I'd have ate 54 boxes of Christmas tree cakes, I probably would have died, first of all. Uh, But I was just amazed because the people just really uh, showed their appreciation. So here's what I want to do. I want to tell you just how lucky you are to have him. Uh, Then I want to ask you to do something for me, okay? I'm not going to ask you to buy double stuffed Oreos, which is Dustin's favorite treat, all right? Do with that what you will, all right? (laughs) But I am not telling you to buy double stuffed Oreos. I'm not telling you that. Have you ever had like reverse psychology? I'm not telling you to do that. Here's what I am telling you to do. Dustin spends a lot of time up here at this Starbucks right here at the corner of Five Force, right? He, he's something about being in the community, all right? That he, he, he says he does his sermon preps there, and he, he spends a lot of time there. He's probably met some of you guys uh, for coffee there. Here's what I want you to do. This week when you're out uh, at the grocery store or you stop by Starbucks yourself, get a $10 gift card, okay? Nobody in here is going broke. Give a $10 gift card and give it to him next week and tell him how much you appreciate him, all right? Yeah, I love that guy. You guys are so lucky uh, to have him. Now, with that being said, let's, uh, let's dive in a little bit. Here's what I want to do. Somebody out front said, oh, we got a substitute teacher today. You know, kinda, we can kind of slack off. Uh, we're not going to slack off. As a matter of fact, we're going to start today with a little quiz. Now, this is a personal quiz, so I don't want you to incriminate yourself by like raising your hand or answering out loud, and I especially don't want you to be the Holy Spirit, right? Here's what that means. I don't want you like looking at your neighbor like, yeah, He's talking to you right now, all right? Holy Spirit don't need your help, okay? Uh, but I do, I want us to have this quiz to lay the groundwork for where we're going today. So, uh, and I, I think this is going to come out strong, uh, but I think it's really important to help us gauge what we think about the church with this quiz, all right? So three questions, all right? Real easy quiz. Question number one, here we go. In a typical month, how often do I come to the weekly gathering of our church on Sunday morning? Somebody's kids incriminate him back there. Like, oh, we don't. <laughs> He's talking about us, mom. No, I'm just. <laughs> you gonna get the beating of a lifetime when you get home. <laughs> I'm just kidding. In a typical month, how often do I come to the weekly gathering of our church on Sunday mornings? 52 months in a year. Most of the time, four month, four weeks in a month, right? Every now and then, we have a fifth Sunday. How often do you come to church on Sunday morning? Y'all ready for this one? Y'all are like, yeah, here we go. All right, question number two. When I miss church, what is the typical reason? Is it a good one? When I miss church, what is the typical reason? Is it a good one? Let me give you an example of a good one, all right? Uh, My kid is vomiting and sick, and I don't want to take them in the elementary room where they'll get everyone else sick. That is a great reason, all right? Clemson losing by 12 points on Saturday night is not a good reason, all right? Now, they hadn't done that in a while. You've had a few good seasons. Uh, Let me hit a little closer to home. Carolina losing by 46 points yesterday is not, some of you are like getting up right now, walking out, all right? That's not a good reason. 
Thus, Brandon is at church today. Question number three. Mm, just <laughs> diving it in there. Question number three. Does my schedule revolve around my involvement in the church, or is it something I just try to fit into my life? Now, I understand these questions uh, can almost come off a little aggressive, and, and I don't mean it to, to do that way. And obviously, uh, there, there's not a pass-fail here, right? There's not like, well, I got two out of three, 66%, and that's a D in some places. No, uh, that, that's, there's not like a pass-fail on this quiz, right? But what I think this quiz does is I think it helps us to gauge how we view the church. Now, and this is a really important thing for us to understand about ourselves as we go into the last week uh, or, or the last couple weeks where we've been looking at the Apostles' Creed because as we go into these la last couple weeks, we're going to be introduced in the Apostles' Creed to the church in such a way that the Apostles' Creed sets up so, the church up for us as an essential, non-negotiable of the Christian life. So just think about how the Apostles' Creed that we've walked through over the past six weeks even plays out, right? The, Bible said, the Apostles' Creed says we believe in God the Father. We believe in God the Son. We believe in God the Holy Spirit. And then what does it say? We believe in the church. So that as important as any of those other things are, we get to the church and it is also non-negotiable. So we've got to know how we think about the church. Thus, today, we're going to get to the part in the creed that reads like this. I believe in the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints. Today, we're going to see this as we look at the Apostles' Creed, that the church is not an optional part of the Christian faith. The church is not an optional part of the Christian faith. It's an absolute necessity. And this is going to confront some of us. Because many of us, as we have this mindset about what the church is and what the church does and my involvement in the church, we view the church as something that we try to fit in as much as possible. But if we don't make it, God's okay with that. And here's what I want us to see this morning, that church isn't optional, it's a necessity. And the same way that uh, all these other things are non-negotiables, the church is a non-negotiable for Christians. With that in mind, look with me at Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 42. Here's what the scripture says. Acts 2, starting in verse 42. This is as the early church is forming, the, the believers are being added to after Pentecost. Verse 42 says, and they devoted themselves, who's they? The new believers. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. What an absolutely radical statement. Let me read that again. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Would you pray with me as we start this morning? Lord, as we start today, Lord, I, I just pray that you would help us to read Scripture and help us to understand what Scripture is teaching us so that we could know you and draw close to you, dear God, that, the, that our lives would look more like how you've designed and less like what we've settled for. It's in Jesus Christ's holy and precious name I pray. Amen. So today what we want to see is that the church is an absolute necessity. In order to see that the church is an absolute necessity, I think what we have to do is answer a few questions about the church. We need to begin to see for ourselves why the church is an absolute necessity. The first question we have to answer as we talk about the necessity of the church is this. Who is the church? Who is the church? We need to understand who is the church if we're going to understand that the church is an absolute necessity? Acts 2 is very helpful here. Look what the scripture says about the identity of the church in Acts chapter 2. It says this, And they devoted themselves. 
They devoted themselves. What did they devote themselves to? Teaching and fellowship, the breaking of the bread, and to the prayers. Now, I, I don't know if you notice this, but look, when the church, when the author of the book of Acts speaks of the church, he doesn't speak of a location. He does not speak of a building, as we so often think of in 2021. He speaks of a group of people. So that when he identifies the church, what he says is, the church is they. In other words, the church is not the location or the building or the facility. The church is the people who are there. Such that, let me just put it in plain terms for you this morning, that this place that we are in is nothing more than a little bit of drywall, some brick and some mortar. And if something were to happen and this place fell apart brick by brick, it would not affect the church at all. The church stands strong because the church is not this building. Y'all okay? You say, I'm, in, I'm from South Georgia. In South Georgia, when the preacher says something good like that, you say amen. Or you can say, go dogs. It doesn't affect me either way. I like it, all right? We are the church. More specifically, not only does the author of Acts speak of of people when he talks about who the church is, he speaks of a very specific group of people. Notice what he says these people do. That they are people who are devoted to the things of God. They are people devoted to the apostles' teaching. Now, we'll talk about this more in just a second. But the apostles' teaching is the Bible. The apostles taught the Old Testament, and then the words that they taught became the New Testament, so that the apostles' teaching was was the Bible, and then it says they were devoted to the, the fellowship and the breaking of bread and the prayers. In other words, that these, this, this church was not just any group of people. It was a very specific group of people who were devoted to the things of God. Now, I don't know if you realize it, but this gives us a very uh, good definition of who the church is, a very clear picture of who the church is. The church is the people of God who are committed to Jesus Christ. That is who the church is. That is what the church is. The people of God who are committed to Jesus Christ. Now, I want to spend some time thinking about this reality, that the church is the people of God who are committed to Jesus Christ, because this helps us understand very clearly uh, uh, what the church is functionally. This means that the church, listen, that the church is the people of God who are committed to Jesus Christ, this means that the church is both expansive and exclusive. The church is both expansive and exclusive. That's the reason for this phrase in the Apostles' Creed that we've been walking through. The phrase in the Apostles' Creed is the Holy Catholic Church and the communion of the saints. Now, this word, Holy Catholic Church, has been a, a cause of like consternation for many of us, has it not? It, it's been like, uh, what do we mean by Catholic there? Because most of you, you've been coming to church here a while, and you thought that we were Baptists, right? Just like the cool kind of Baptist who doesn't put Baptist in their name, right? We're upstate church five forks and down at the bottom a campus of first baptist simpsonville we're we're the cool baptists right now others of you this word hadn't bothered you that much because you grew up catholic right and you're like thinking i've been to a catholic church house and this ain't it right some of the, the the ones who grew up catholic laugh right they know what i'm talking about so what does it mean that the word, the word Catholic here mean? We need to understand the word Catholic here is not referring to any denomination or, or, or association of Catholicism. They remember, when the, when the creed came about, there was no Catholic church. right? If you would have went up to the early church, the church fathers, the apostles, those who lived in the first and second century after Jesus, and said, do you belong to the Catholic church or the Baptist church? They would have looked at you like you were crazy. They would have said, man, I go to church in Bob's house down the road, right? What do you mean Catholic or Baptist? Like, sometimes we baptize, but I don't really understand the question. You see, there was just the church. And the word Catholic here, the word Catholic here essentially has two meanings. The first thing it means is the word Catholic here means universal. It means the universal church. But Catholic also means, the, the word Catholic also, also means according to the whole. So get this. The church is expansive, 
Because we are the holy Catholic church, that means we're expansive because we are the church and the big C church is any gathering, any denomination, in any location or body of believers that falls up under the banner of Jesus Christ is Lord. Here's why this is practically, you should kind of put this in your mind. When you leave here today and go to lunch, you're going to pass by 17 churches before you get where you're going, right? We're going to pass by a Baptist church. We're going to pass by two mainline Protestant churches, a Lutheran church, and a Presbyterian church, right? And as we pass by, we're going to wonder to ourselves, what's the difference in all these churches? And here's what I want you to understand, that there are some significant theological differences. But any church that is serious about falling under the banner as the, uh, of Jesus Christ as Lord, as Scripture proclaims Him as Lord, then they are your brothers and sisters in Christ. We are a part of, ultimately, one church, the Holy Catholic Church. Now, I said it's expansive. Let me tell you, it's also exclusive. That word Catholic, when it means according to the whole, here's what it means. That you can't just believe whatever you want to believe as a church. That you are actually limited to what all the churches are supposed to believe according to the whole, uh, the whole of Scripture. Such that, listen, you can call yourself a church all day long. But if you go against what Scripture teaches, you're no more a church than you are a garage or an amphitheater. The church is expansive and it's exclusive. Now, here's, here's why this is important for you here today. We need to understand the implications of this because here's what this means. The building is not the church. The people are the church. You are the church, Upstate Church Five Forks. And we have to keep this in mind in this consumeristic culture that we live in that approaches church as if church's only purpose was to meet needs that I have. This is why people go to the, the church that suits them best and they're switching churches every five minutes, right? Well, this church has got a better kids program. This church has got a, a better preacher. This church has got a better band. And, and we're not for that because that's, that mindset says what can church do for me and what Scripture is teaching us is that you are the church. So the question needs to be what can you do for the church? So the church is an absolute necessity because you are the church. You can't get away from that. You are the church. Who is the church? You are the church. The second question we need to answer, if we're going to understand the necessity of the church, is this. We need to understand what does the church do? We need to answer the question, what does the church do? Now, Acts 2, man, this is just one of the most immensely helpful texts on, on defining the priorities and activities of the church. Notice what Scripture says. It says, they devoted themselves to very specific things, to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to the prayers. Now, uh, I, I said this a second ago, but like, let's just theologically understand this. The apostles' teaching is what will become Scripture. Because as the apostles uh, taught about who Jesus was, you can go through Acts and find that the apostles used the Old Testament to teach about Jesus. Now, as the apostles taught the Old Testament about Jesus, the words that they wrote down and then disseminated about who Jesus was, the Gospels, and how Jesus should impact our life, the epistles, these words became the apostles' teaching. So the first thing the church does, listen, the church teaches the Bible. It says they were devoted to the apostles' teaching. And understand this, guys. First of all, understand that when we think about it that way, the, the apostles did not care to teach the Bible in any other way than to say that the Bible was all about Jesus. The Old Testament, you go read Genesis, you go read Isaiah, you go read Judges, all of it's about Jesus who is coming. In the New Testament, all about Jesus. The Bible was about Jesus, which brings us to the primary task of what does the church do? The primary task of the church is that the church teaches the Bible. The church teaches about who Jesus Christ is and what Jesus Christ has done and what Jesus Christ will one day ultimately do. And I want you to understand 
that this is the primary role of the church because it is the uniquely uh, only role of the church that the church can do in the world. In a world that cares nothing about what God has to say, if the church does not teach the Bible, no one else will. So understand this. The church's primary responsibility, parents, is not to disciple your children. You know whose job that is? Yours. The church's primary responsibility is not to produce such a good uh, uh, service on Sunday morning that it evokes an emotional response in you so that you leave feeling encouraged. And now listen, I hope that those things happen. I hope that your children learn about Jesus. I know, man, I got a six-year-old right here who who was already up in, in kid service this morning. She learned so much about Jesus up there. And I hope that you feel encouraged when you leave. But I want you to understand the primary purpose of the church is to teach the Word of God. First, the church teaches the Bible. Secondly, what does the church do? The church does life together. The church does life together. It says they were devoted to the fellowship. They were devoted to the community of believers. Now, here's what I love about this, is it enlightens us on just what this community looked like. Notice what it says. It says, first of all, about this community, that they they held all things in common. And when anyone had need, they would sell their possessions and, and give as any had need. Now, here's what I love about this. This is not coerced generosity. You know what coerced generosity is called? Especially if a government intervenes, coerced generosity is called socialism. Now, get this. Christians just don't need that because Christians understand this, that it is not the government's responsibility to tell us to take care of our own people. You know who tells us that? Jesus. Such that, listen, this was such the, 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 the way of doing things that they just all got together on Wednesday night prayer meeting, you know, they, as one does. And at Wednesday night prayer meeting, they heard about Joe, and Joe had lost his job, and Joe couldn't pay the mortgage. And so here's what they decided. Hey, somebody, we got to chip in the money to pay Joe's mortgage. Who is going to sell what? Can I just tell you, that is a completely different way of life than most of us have grown accustomed to in the modern church. Most of us, when we come in, we don't want to admit that we got a need, much less have someone else try to meet that need. So what do we say? How you doing, brother? Well, I lost my job this week, but I'm not going to tell you that. It's how you do. I'm doing fine, right? Good. You and your wife just got in a bad argument on the way here because you don't know how you're going to pay the mortgage, but everything's great. You ever seen those old, those old insurance commercials? The house is on fire behind you, right? Everything's good. This is a different level of community than what we've grown accustomed to. But notice this, and this is what really got me. It says that they were in each other's homes, like receiving bread together. And and this phrase, day by day, is used. Now, listen, I got a small uh, Bible study that I do for people, uh, for members of my gym in my house on Thursday night. And every Thursday night, we have to get ready. And on Thursday morning, my wife asks me the same question every Thursday morning. Have you cleaned the bathroom yet, right? In other words, one of us has got to clean it most of the time. It ends up, that's a suggestion, really. It's not really a suggestion. Maybe it's a command. I don't know. She's in here. I'm probably getting myself in trouble. (laughs) But on Thursday night, she asked me this question. Have you cleaned the guest bathroom? Why? Because we have people coming over, and she she wants to make sure that our house is clean. I cannot imagine the twitch that would exist in her neck if people were in our homes day by day, right? But this is just the way that they do life. That they, they were with one another. They supported one another. They loved one another. And here's what, comes to, here's what comes out of this. I want you to understand this. The gathering of the saints together on a Sunday morning is the bare minimum for Christians, not the only requirement. The, we're called to a fellowship that is so much more. Christian, please understand, following Jesus is not a solo assignment. It's a group project, and we are not called to a me and Jesus kind of faith. We are called to an us and Jesus existence. They were devoted to fellowship. Third thing, the church remembers Christ together. It says they were devoted to the breaking of bread. Now, there's little doubt 
that this phrase, devoted to the breaking of bread, refers to the Lord's Supper. And here's what that means. That they would get together and they would just stop and remember what brought them together in the first place. And what brings us together? Is it the fact that we all look alike, think alike, act alike, vote alike, that we all have the same hobbies? No. What makes us a church is none of those things. What makes us a church is that Jesus Christ, that though he were God, became man, and that though he were the God-man, decided to die on a cross, and that though he died on a cross and was placed in a tomb, rose again on the third day. That is what brings us together. And so the church would celebrate the Lord's Supper in remembrance of that. And guess what? Today, before we close, I can't think of a better way as we talk about the importance of the church than celebrating the Lord's Supper together. Finally, fourth and finally, the church prays together. It says they were devoted to the prayers. Evidently, the early church was devoted to and dependent upon God. So bring all of this together. Let me, let me put it to you this way. If we put all of this together, and I were to describe this to you, a church that, that was devoted to hearing the Bible, teaching the Bible, a church that was devoted to praying together and remembering the Lord together and, and doing life together, and I said, hey, we're going to do this once a week, and we're going to do this on Sunday morning at 10 o'clock and again at 11.15. What, what would I be describing? I would be describing Sunday morning worship. So I want you to see this, that a good starting point for how to understand the church is an absolute necessity is to begin to understand that what we do here on Sunday morning is an absolute necessity. Listen, Christian parents, let me tell it to you this way. It should be the exception that you get up and don't go to church, not the exception that you get up and you do go to church. The church is an absolute necessity because worshiping God is an absolute necessity. Finally, in order to stand that the church is an absolute necessity, we need to answer this question. What unifies the church? What unifies the church? Let me just say this. If if this seems like, Tough. Let me just say that if I was at Upstate Church Harrison Bridge, I would be preaching the exact same message. All right, I didn't come like to Five Forks to, and like choose violence this morning. All right, the only the only thing I did was just change the initials at the top of the the, the sermon notes. Right, instead of UCHB at the top of my notes, it says UCFF. All right, so if this if you're like, oh, this guy's a real jerk, let me just encourage you with this. Dustin will be back next week, and you, it'll be great. All right. <laughs> Last question we need to answer is this: What unifies the church? What unifies the church? Acts shows us two things that unifies the church. Now, I want us to stop for just a moment and to lean in on this point and to think long and hard about what unifies the church because I think it's important that in a church like ours, we spend some time thinking about unity. Because the reality is, especially in a church like ours, if we are not careful, we could drift into an us versus them mentality. And I would, I would say this at Upstate Church Harrison Bridge. I would say this at Upstate Church Five Forks. I would say it at Malden and Simpsonville downtown. If we are not careful, when you become one church across five locations, we can drift into an us versus them mentality such that Dustin or me or Wayne can get up on stage and say one church, five locations, and we can believe that, and maybe we can have that in our hearts, but in the pews it can begin to feel like why does one have have more than the other why does this one get that one and what can happen is we can begin to drift into an us versus them mentality such that listen if i it, let me just give you a practical illustration the adair family's in here right now just became y'all's uh kids coordinator for five forks man they had been coming to harrison bridge and and love that family And if I had let the us versus them mentality come in, what I could have said is, why do they get one of my best families? And I'm just going to ask, why do y'all? No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) And here's the point. If we're truly going to become a church that celebrates every win as a win, not for one, but for the whole, we've got to lean into what unifies us, not what separates us. So what does Acts say about what unifies us? Two things unifies. Two things unifies. First, I want you to understand this. The message brings unity. The message brings unity. In Acts, unity is built on the reality that all of the people were devoted to one thing. What is it they were devoted to? The fact, the message, the reality that Jesus Christ is Lord. 
Here's what I want you to understand. When two people simultaneously believe this truth, that Jesus Christ is Lord, they become knit together at the level of the soul. Such that, so strong is this connection that it overrides over, over every difference. There is no difference in race. There is no difference in economics, social class, or political ideology that is stronger than the connection brought on by believing in Christ. This is so true that you have, by, by the blood of Jesus Christ, more in common with a believer who you've never met and who has a life that's completely different than you in sub-Saharan Africa than you have in common with a non-believing co-worker who roots for the same college team as you do. You see, the blood of Christ is what produces unity among the body. I'll get to it in a second. We'll keep going. Secondly, the thing that brings unity is this. In Acts 2, the, the, the mission of Christ brings unity. In Acts 2, the people lived on mission for Jesus. Think about this with me. The Bible says that the Lord was adding to their number day by day. Now, I don't know if you know this, but typically the Lord adds to the number of believers by believers going and talking about Jesus to other people. Very rarely do people get saved spontaneously, right? Just, well, why are you a Christian? Did someone tell you about Jesus? No one told me nothing about no one. That's the South Georgia way of saying that, all right? Very rarely does that happen. Most of the time, when people are added to the number of the believers, what happens is one person tells another person about who Jesus Christ is and what Jesus Christ has done. Such that the people in Acts 2 were obviously living on mission. Here's what they weren't doing. This means that the believers in Acts 2 were not arguing on, with one another on social media about who the best choice for Roman emperor was. They didn't get on social media posts and say, hey, listen, Domination is just way too liberal on these five issues, but I also think Vespian's too conservative on these five issues. That just wasn't a top priority for them. Did they have their opinions? Absolutely they did. But it was not more important than living on mission for Jesus. They weren't arguing in church business meetings about the color of the walls. They, they didn't stop going to church because the song selection and, and, the, and the music level wasn't quite as high as they like it. They didn't stop speaking to each other because person A said something stupid to person B in group. No, they put aside their differences to live on mission. And later, when disputes did arise, they handled them quickly so that the mission of Jesus would not be disrupted. The point could not be any clearer for us. The salvation of lost souls is more important than any of the general differences that exist in this room. The mission of Jesus brings unity among the people. The church is a necessity because the message of Jesus and the mission of Jesus is what the war lost and dying world around us need more than anything else. As we close, man, I pray what's happened. As we talk about the essential nature of the church, I pray this what's beginning to happen is that in your mind you would start to be challenged about the nature of the church and your relationship with the church. That this is not something that is optional for those of us who have been bought again by the blood of Jesus Christ. That this is an absolute necessity. And I would challenge you this. Would you just consider this morning? Would you just consider whether your life looks like the lives of the early believers in Acts chapter 2? And let me just say this. If the answer to that is no, here's what I don't want you to do. I don't want you to just take your ball and go home and leave here just all beat up because the preacher said, man, I'm supposed to be all in. And if I can't be all in, I'm just going to be all out. All right? That's not what I'm saying. That's not what this text is saying. But Acts chapter 2 is giving us a description of what happens in the lives of people when they grow more and more and more serious with Jesus. So let me ask you this. If your life doesn't look like Acts chapter 2, what is it that you can do right here and now that would begin to move you in that direction? 
Maybe it's just prioritizing this meeting. Maybe it's, it's saying to yourself, Dad, Mom, maybe it's saying to yourself as a family, we are not going to let the distractions of this world pull us away from where we need to be every Sunday morning. It is going to be an expectation that our kids wake up and they're going to know that we're going to church. But maybe you, maybe you prioritize this. Let me ask you this. Is the next step for you doing life in community? Maybe you need to join a small group. Do you know that Five Forks launched like five small groups this semester? We've got a place where we can put you in a small group. Maybe it's that you give of yourself to the church for the first time. I don't know what happened. Something happened like nine months ago with the water in Five Forks. Y'all got babies everywhere back there. Like, I, I, I'm pretty sure we're breaking all kind of codes with the amount of babies in that, those rooms, okay? Maybe one way that you can, your life can begin to look more like Acts chapter 2 is you go and you volunteer your time. You get down on your knees and tell a kid about Jesus. Man, that's looking a lot more like Acts 2. How can you begin to move your life in the direction of Acts chapter 2? As we close, the, the people who are serving the Lord's Supper, I just would challenge you, come on forward. and They're going to begin to pass out elements. As they pass out elements this morning, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper. Now, remember what the Lord's Supper is. It is us remembering who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. Now, let me just say really quickly, if you are a non-believer this morning, that means you have never given your life to Christ, this is something that is uniquely suited for the body of Christ. So that if you're not a believer, I would just ask you, let this tray pass over you today. But if you are a believer, we're going to take and we're going to remember the Lord Jesus Christ together. And as they pass the elements, here's what I'm going to do. It's going to be a little bit different. As they pass the tray, I want you to take a few moments and do two things. First, I want you to spend some time thinking about who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. And then I want you to spend some time asking, does your life look like Acts chapter 2? And what do you need to change so that it begins to? As they pass the trays, I want you to spend some time praying, thanking God, and praying prayers of repentance right now. this moment in reflection we worship the king of kings whose death on the cross unites our hearts and gives us hope for all eternity and so would you take the elements today and first take your bread 
and hear Scripture's words. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is before you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take and eat. Now the cup. In the same way he took the cup after supper saying, This is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Take and drink. Would you pray with me, church? Lord, you are the Father of all eternity, our God and King. And we praise you and we glorify you. Thank you for uniting our hearts together by the blood of Jesus Christ. We leave here today worshiping you as Lord. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Church, you are dismissed.